Chapter 5 Retracing History Help! Chet shouted, flinging out both arms as he felt himself falling. Frank, Joe, and the general, still mapping their strategy in front of the old headquarters, heard the cry from the knoll. Chet's in trouble, Frank yelled and started running. The others kept close behind him and arrived at the scene at almost the same moment. There was not a sound. Chet! Chet! Where are you? Frank called. When there was no answer, the Hardys became alarmed. The general walked toward the edge of the woods. In a moment, he called. Here he is! The officer dropped to his knees beside a deep hole, the opening of which was nearly concealed by a growth of low bushes and grass. I've got one of his legs. Give me a hand with the other, boys. Frank leaned far over and grasped the other leg. Together, he and the general pulled Chet to a sprawling position on the level ground. What, 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 what hit me? Chet sputtered. He's still a bit dazed. Nothing hit you, General Smith replied. You fell into a dry well. As Chet rubbed his head ruefully, he told them that he'd tumbled in while trying to get a picture of a fleeing figure. Where'd he go? Joe asked excitedly. That way, Chet pointed to the right. He, hey, where's my camera? Frantically, Chet began combing the brush. The others joined him in the search. Minutes later, Chet shouted with relief. Here it is, he cried, lifting the mechanism out of the patch of soft grass. And not a scratch on it. What about the man you saw, Joe persisted. Are you sure you saw one? Sure, I'm sure, Chet replied ruffled by the implication. What did he look like? Frank asked. I didn't get a good focus on him. And he's far away by this time, Joe said ruefully. As the group started back to the farmhouse, Frank noticed that Chet was limping a little and asked if he wanted to go back to the general's house. I'll be okay, the boy answered. I wonder where that spy Bingham went. What do you fellows think? Frank and Joe shrugged. I'd like to hear the story of the battle first, Frank said. General Smith, will you explain where the troops were stationed? The officer turned to a hill beyond one of them from which he had come. And with a sweep of his arm said that ridge was held by the northern troops. They had three lines of riflemen, backed by a strong force of artillery. They pushed down the hill and captured your great-grandfather's headquarters, Joe surmised. Not exactly. It was sort of in a no-man's land. The southern troops were in this valley when the attack began. They retreated to that ridge over there. He pointed to another hill a mile away, which was higher and steeper than the one that the Federals had held. If Bingham got into your great-grandfather's headquarters, Joe continued, all he'd have had to do would have been to hide until the battle was over. It wasn't as easy as that, the general said, smiling at Joe. Great-grandfather had a force of cavalry in reserve. They counterattacked on the left flank and cut a wedge into the opposing forces. So Bingham was checked from going straight back to his own lines, Frank mused. It seems to me that he wouldn't have had a chance to get through that line of cavalry, the officer agreed. And Bingham would have had to go around the cavalry and along the rocky run, Frank reasoned until he could contact his own forces again. That's good thinking, Frank, the general said. If he did go along Rocky Run, he probably ran into more trouble, because artillery, which was rushed to my great-grandfather's aid, opened up from the opposite ridge. From all accounts, it was a terrific onslaught. He might not have come out of it alive, Joe commented. But if he did, I think he'd have gone into the direction that Frank indicated. True enough, the general stated. Then let's follow that trail, Joe exclaimed. Remember one thing, General Smith said. A good soldier makes the most of the natural cover. Bingham would have made his way behind trees, boulders, along depressions in the ground, behind slight rises to afford protection from the artillery. Well, let's start. Gosh, Chet said, I never thought of that. All I could think of was that I would just beeline it as fast as I could. What a target you'd be, Joe teased, as they started on the trail which Bingham might have taken. 
Frank led the way, and the general nodded approvingly as the boy picked out a route, which provided the least exposure to cannon, which years before had thundered from the ridge across the valley. "'You're a natural-born soldier, Frank,' the officer said, smiling. The trek was hot and arduous. Finally, they came to the bank of Rocky Run. "'I think Bingham would have followed the stream here,' Frank observed." Right, the general agreed. He'd have tried to put water between him and that daredevil cavalry. Hey, Chet shouted suddenly. There's a bridge Bingham could have hidden under. They came into sight of a span which carried the main highway over the rocky run. Only, that's a concrete ridge, Joe countered. It must have been built long after the Civil War. By this time, the four were within a stone's throw of the span. Suddenly, a black sedan whizzed over it, the driver glancing down in surprise at the three boys and the officer. The brakes jammed on, bringing it to a screeching halt out of sight of the searches. "'That looks like the same sedan that tried to wreck our car,' Frank cried. "'I'm going after it!' He made his way up the side of a steep embankment, to the edge of the bridge. Just as he spotted the back of the driver's head... The car's wheels spun, and the automobile streaked down the highway with a roar. The license plate on the back of the car was still covered with mud, hiding the numbers. "'Where do you suppose he was going?' Joe asked, as he and the others reached the top of the embankment. "'The road comes to a fork up there away,' General Smith said, pointing. "'One branch runs past the Beauregard Smith plantation.' Frank whistled. I'll bet Bush was in that car and is on his way to the plantation. Let's hurry there, Joe exclaimed. It's quite a walk from here, the officer warned, and a long hike back to our car. One of us can go for the car, Joe said. Let me, Chad offered. Frank gave him the keys. If we don't get to the plantation before you do, pick us up on the highway. Frank, Joe, and the general set off down the road toward the plantation. When they came to the fork, they took the left one, and were halfway to the Civil War farm of the Smith family when a horn blew behind them. The hardy convertible rolled to a halt, and the hikers got in. "'I thought you were lost,' Joe remarked as they drove on. "'What happened?' "'Nothing,' Chet replied. "'I just stopped at that little store along the highway. Here, have some candy.' <laughs> he thrust a bar into the hands of Frank and Joe, and then turned to the officer. "'Will you have some, sir?' Chet asked self-consciously. "'Thank you. I'd like it.' Chet grinned. "'I didn't know whether generals ate candy bars or not.' "'I guess all men have a sweet tooth,' the officer said, smiling. "'Besides, soldiers eat chocolate before combat to get extra energy.' Chet looked askance at the general. "'I prefer to eat my candy in peace and quiet.' Frank winked at Joe. You may need some for the battle right now, Chet. Never can tell what may happen if we run into Dr. Bush at the plantation. At General Smith's directions, Chet presently eased the car off the highway and onto a rutted trail overgrown with weeds. There was no sign of the black sedan or any evidence that a car had recently entered the lane. This was a fine place once, the general said. Those boxwoods over there are all that's left of a wonderful garden which stretched from the road to the mansion. My father had pictures of the old place. At the general's suggestion, Chet stopped the car alongside a low, crumbling wall. Look over there, the man continued, extending his arm in a gesture toward a large cluster of oak trees which seemed to form a military phalanx. That's where the big white house stood, the ruins of the old mansion were scarcely visible through the tall grass and brush, which acted as scar tissue of time to cover the wounds left by the war. The four got out of the car and pushed through the weeds toward the area. The officer stopped and held his two hands parallel in front of him. The steps to the front patico were right here. They led to the beautiful center hall of one of the most picturesque homes in the whole south. And look what's left now. Nothing, General Smith remarked sadly. Nothing but ghostly memories. 
and a cache full of gold somewhere around here, Frank reminded him, turning his thoughts to the work at hand. General Smith, was the cellar of this place ever searched? The officer looked intently at the mass of overgrown rubble before them and then mopped his brow with a handkerchief. It's been searched at one time or another by three generations. And they found nothing? Not a thing. That's why somebody's been digging elsewhere on the plantation, trying to find the gold. The four walked around in silence for several minutes. I think the first thing we should do is investigate the old farmhouse headquarters. That's now the museum, Frank said at last. We may find a battlefield relic that could provide a clue. Maybe Bingham even hid the bandolier someplace in the old building, and it hasn't yet been found. Good logic, General Smith agreed after a pause. I can see you're a better detective than I am. Joe grinned. You can't live with Dad all your life without learning something about sleuthing. Well, let's go to the museum immediately, Frank continued. Then seeing a distressed look on Chet's face, he added, I mean, after lunch. <laughs> they made their way back to the car and drove to Centerville, past green fields of tobacco, which bordered on either side of the road. I think you boys can do your checking without me, the officer decided when lunch at his house was over. I have a little business to attend to in town. Chet, who was sleepy from having overeaten, would have liked to take a nap, but the boys urged him to accompany them. Half an hour later, they drove up to the museum. Frank parked, and they entered the front door of the erstwhile farmhouse headquarters. Just think, said Joe in awe. Once, old General Smith and his staff walked through this door, just like we're doing. Inside the doorway, the boys were met by an old man wearing a gray uniform similar to the Civil War uniform of the Confederate Army. He had a kindly, wrinkled face and a fringe of snow-white hair. "'Welcome to our little museum of the Battle of Rocky Run,' he said pleasantly. Frank noticed a sign that said that the museum was run by the County Historical Society and that a small admission was asked. He paid for the three of them. We'd like to look over the relics, Joe said eagerly. Help yourself, the old man said with a flourish of his hand as he sat down again. This house is full of things that they dug up from the battlefield. The boys stood for a moment, taking in their surroundings. Pictures of the famous battle scenes and historic plantations covered three walls, while a huge fireplace with its carved mantle occupied most of the remaining wall. Frank walked to one of the exhibits. Look at these pistols, he said, bending over the table to examine a collection of many shapes and sizes. Here's something that'll interest you, Joe said to Chet. Some Civil War photographs. The boys turned their attention to the wall, where half a dozen rare old pictures showed a local encampment just before the Battle of Rocky Run. Don't forget, we're looking for a clue for that old bandolier, Frank remarked. You'll not find a clue here. The words boomed from behind the boys, and they whirled around to face the speaker, who'd appeared as if out of nowhere. He was a tall, thin man, whose long, sharp nose was accentuated by a broad black mustache and flowing black hair. Dressed in a costume of the plantation owner of the Civil War period, the man looked as if he'd stepped out of one of the museum photographs. I'm Professor Randolph, he stated with a deep voice. Why are you boys trespassing on my property? We understood that this was a museum, Professor, open to the public, Frank exclaimed. The man raised his eyebrows and with a half smile said, It was a museum until I bought it. You see, I'm a doctor of philosophy. I'm writing a book on the history of the Civil War, so I bought the museum to catch the spirit of the thing, you understand? We don't understand, Joe countered. That old fellow over there, the boy turned. The chair by the doorway was empty. What fellow? Professor Randolph asked. Chet's eyes popped. He edged toward the door as the Hardys protested leaving so soon. You haven't any right on my private property, roared the man suddenly. Get out! End of chapter 5